You can tell they're coming home when you look up and you see the wife. Their smile gets bigger and bigger and bigger the closer they get home. God is faithful. I was reminded of a story this morning. I figured I'd open up with this. How about that? Reminded of a story this morning. A guy gets pulled over. He's an officer. They get pulled over. A cop pulls him over. He pulls him over, and he realizes he's only doing like one mile over the speed limit. And so he tells the officer, he said, man, I can't believe that you're going to write me a ticket. I'm only going one mile over the speed limit. So the officer looks at his driver's license, and he looks and he sees where he has to have glasses, where he's supposed to be wearing glasses. And he looks at the guy, and the guy don't have glasses on. So he tells the guy, he said, look, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. So I'm not going to write you up for that. I'm going to write you up because you don't have glasses. And the guy says, I've got contacts. And the officer said, I don't care who you know. I'll be here all night, amen? We've been talking about faith, and we've been talking about dealing with faith. And if you come on Wednesday night, uh, we've been talking about the ABCs of faith. And I want to really deal with that this morning. We're going to talk about faith, and, and really faith is really the core of what we need in our life to survive, amen? We need faith. And so we're going to be dealing with that this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time together. Now, God, I pray. God, I enjoy having a good time, enjoy laughing. God, I pray you open our hearts today, and God, I, I just, in my spirit today, I sense a heaviness. And God, maybe there's some here today that are just dealing with some strong holds in their life, and maybe some heaviness going on in their homes, and God, I don't know what it is, but Father, I pray right now that you'll begin to, begin to show yourself real in their hearts. Just keep your head bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to pray right now for that. If you're here this morning, no one looking around, maybe you showed up today, and maybe for whatever reason, maybe you're walking through some unfamiliar territory. Maybe something's going on in the marriage. Maybe something's going on with the children. Maybe something's going on in the finances. I don't really know what it is. All I want you to know is we love you and we want to pray for you. So if you're here this morning and you're going through something, we're not here to embarrass you. We're not here to call you out. None of those things. Matter of fact, we just have your head bowed, eyes closed. I just want to pray for you. If you're going through something this morning, you say, Pastor, just pray for me. Just right where you're at. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise it and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Just raise it and put it back down. Hands all over. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Just raise it and put it back down. Thank you, Father. See those hands. Anyone else? Don't want to miss an opportunity. Just want to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you right now for every hand that was lifted. God, I don't know what they stand in need of. God, I know that we live in a real world with real problems. But God, you're a real, you're a real God with real answers. And so, Father, I thank you right now that you're going to touch him. God, I thank you that whatever they need, God, you're going to enlighten him. God, I pray today, at this moment, God, they begin to cast their burdens upon you. God, your shoulders are much bigger than ours, and you can carry it much better than we can. So, God, as they cast their cares upon you, God, I pray right now that you open their hearts to receive, open their eyes to be enlightened. God, I pray this day is a day that, God, you use to further your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're talking about the ABCs of faith, and you cannot talk about faith without going to Hebrews 11. I want to read that, so bear with me here. We're going to look at Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verse 1. It's going to give you the definition of faith. If you don't know the definition of faith, here it is right now. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Let me read it again so you got that real clear. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Many times we don't see what's going on, but we believe God can do all things, right? Amen, yes. We have faith. Amen. For by it, the elders obtain a good testimony. We've been dealing a lot about testimony. We've been talking about overcoming by the word of our testimony. And so these guys right here have already have a testimony that they shared. We're going to read off a couple of things by faith would happen. It says here, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. In other words, God spoke it into existence, amen? Now, I always make a joke and I always say, you know what, I believe in the bang theory. Now, when I say that, immediately people look up and they go, oh, my God, I'm in the wrong church. But what I mean by that, in a, in a joking way, is God said it and bang, it happened, amen? God spoke it into existence. There was nothing here. It was without void. It was empty. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, amen? We serve a mighty God to speak things into existence. Now, here's some of the history. By faith... Let me jump down here. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that they did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, 
he had his testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. Now, here's the reality with that, okay? Whether you believe it or not, he's still God. Amen? Amen? Amen. He's still God. But this guy here, he believed God. He was taken away with God. Now, let's keep going here. It says, now Noah, being definitely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for saving of his household. Now, can you imagine? Here's a guy that never seen rain. Because you've got to understand, during this time, according to theologians, according to different studies, it didn't rain. The water was just kind of a moist from the earth. Just moisture came from the earth. So they never seen rain before. And all of a sudden, now God speaks to him and says, build an ark, it's going to rain. Yeah. That's crazy, amen? Yeah. So now he believes and he starts building an ark. Now, through his, his preaching and through his word, he's given testimony, no one is coming to God. Now, I don't know about you, but that would be really discouraging. Amen? If I preached for many years, this guy preached and no one got saved. That'd be hard. But you know what? By faith, he said, I'm going to trust you, God. You said it. I believe it. And that's good enough for me. And see, by faith, sometimes we've got to come to that place in our life. Maybe you're praying for a loved one. Maybe you're praying for a spouse. Maybe you're praying for your children. Maybe you're praying for somebody that you really care deeply about. And right now, you don't see the results. Yeah. Right now, you just heard that last night they went out partying. Yeah. Last night, they did some crazy things. Last night, and you're, you're just at the point now where like, God, oh, I just can't believe. But you know what you got to do? You got to keep praying. Amen. Because by faith, I believe with all my heart, God wants them safe. Yes. Amen. God don't want anyone to perish. So he believes, and he's talking about his family here, and he says, with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and, and became heirs of righteousness, which is ever, according to faith. By faith, all these things were done. Now, I'm going to give you the ABCs of faith, and I'm going to go through the first three kind of quickly because I want to really deal with the last one. Here's the first one. Here's by faith, the A. You've got to ask, okay? You've got to learn to ask. You've got to learn to say, you know, Here's what he says in James. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Here's a reality that we need to see. God does not set us up to fail. God wants to have everything we need come from God. God wants to have us complete, lacking nothing. Okay? If we lack anything, this is what we're going to read here. It's going to come up in a second here. He goes on to say, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberty and without reproach and will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. Again, here comes faith. We got to ask believing. Listen, if you pray for somebody to be healed and all of a sudden they're healed, don't be shocked. Okay? Don't go, oh, I can't believe they're healed. I've been praying for them. Now they're healed. Well, you know what? By faith, you believe that they're going to be healed. By faith, you believe God's going to touch him. By faith, you believe God's going to restore him. Don't be shocked. Why are we praying? Why are we believing? We have to believe that God can do all these things, right? And so he says here, and let him ask in faith, not, not doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. This is an area that we all probably have to deal with. I wish I could tell you that I, I lived a life that I never doubted. I wish I could say that, but no, there's been a lot of times in my life where I've been facing things and I'm going, God, are you really doing this? God, are you really in this? Yeah, but you know what? That's when we have to say, you know what? I don't want to be double-minded. I don't want to be tossed around. I want to believe, God, you said it, and that settles it. Yeah. Listen, even building this church, I mean, I've been here almost 20 years. This is a huge step. Some of you see it, you see a building, you say, oh, that's great. It's exciting. We've got a new building. For me, it's a huge step. It's a huge step because, yeah. listen, I never thought I'd see the day where I'm going to build another building. I remember when we built the gymnasium in the back. Man, by faith, we believed for the gymnasium. As soon as we got it built, we signed the note on it. All of a sudden, the war broke out, and we lost half the church overnight. Yep. You talk about freak you out. That's when you're going, God, did I miss you? God, did I miss you? You know what? We, at the end of the year, the finances came in, and it never lacked one bit. Yes, on. Why? Because God was in it. By faith, we have to believe, God, you said it. That settles it. We don't always get our mind around it, and sometimes we doubt. And again, I wish I could say I never doubt it. But you know what? We've got to come to a place where we start believing God said it. Amen. God wants to do it. Amen? Strong, strong ways. Now, here we go. We're talking about asking. Now, we fail in our lives a lot of times because we don't ask. Amen? Yeah. We don't ask. When's the last time you asked God for something? Yeah, When's the last time you asked? You've got to believe. I tell a story about one time I was, had got back from Russia, and I was living in a little house. We eventually bought it. 
but it had a bad problem with the sewer, and, and, and I was underneath it trying to fix the plumbing, and I'm underneath the house soaking wet and cold in the winter, and I'm aggravated, and I cannot figure this thing out. I couldn't figure out how to put this part here and this part here. How was I going to tie in this old cast iron to the PVC? And I'm like, how is this all? And I mean, I'm just like, just, just frustrated. Finally, in, in that mess, I dropped my hands. I'm laying underneath the house, and I cried out to God. And I said, God, you said we have not because we asked. Now, God, you've got to show me how to do this. And I'm not going to lie to you. As soon as I opened my eyes, it was clear as day. I understood it perfectly what I needed to do. Now, I know for some of you, you said, well, that's kind of simple. But you know what? We've got to get to the place where we bring some of the simplicity back to the gospel of Christ. Because sometimes we make it too complicated. Sometimes we think we can only ask for big things. Sometimes God wants us to just ask for some of the small things in life. And some of these smaller things in life, they add up to big things. The Bible says little foxes on the vine destroy the vineyard. Sometimes these little things in our life is what destroys our lives. So we've got to get back to asking for all these things. Because he says in Matthew 7, 7, Ask and be given to you, seek and you find. Not going to be open. Now here's the other thing. When we ask... A lot of times, we've got to have that childlike faith, that childlike faith. Why? You ever seen a kid that just believes? Huh? There are kids that I'd rather them pray for me than you pray for me because there's some kids that just they believe that God can do all things. I remember one time I told this story. I was in Russia, and this lady came to our church for the very first time. You could tell she was real questionable about coming, and, you know, she was kind of standoff. And, and all of a sudden, you know, I prayed, and I said, you know, I believe God can do all things. And all of a sudden, she came up front, and she was a little bit arrogant and a little bit rude. And she walked up front, and she says, I lost a ruby out of my ring. Can your God find that ruby? And it didn't, she, that's right. She said, it didn't belong to me. I borrowed it. Can your God find that ruby? I said, I don't know. Let's ask him. And so I prayed with her, and I'm just believing God. I just pray right now. This is not hers, and I know it's valuable, and I know, God, that she's going to be in trouble if she can't find this ring because, you know, that's probably more wages she makes in a year. And, God, I just pray right now that you help her find this ring. And so she just kind of, like, walked away. It wasn't two minutes later. Some little boy walked up and said, hey, pastor, look what I found. I said, catch that lady. <laughs> went caught the lady, brought her back in, and I said, is this yours? And she went, oh, my God. You know what she did? She pulled out a grocery list. Can God have this? Can God pray for that? She started praying for everything. <laughs> Why? Because she had a childlike faith. See, that's how we need to come sometimes. Sometimes we just got to come, come with the purity and say, God, we believe that you can do these things. But see, we get so full of junk and so analytical, we try to figure out, well, if we can't figure it out in our mind, then it can't work out. That's what happens. I know for me that's what happens. Maybe I'm the only one who knows that or does that. But a lot of times I get so analytical and I'm like, well, if I can't figure it out, I know God can't figure it out. How stupid is that? God knows all things. Amen? That's why we got to believe. Say, God, I'm just going to trust God. I don't understand it. I don't know how it's going to take place. You know, it's like building this building. Man, I ain't going to lie to you. I never did anything that large. But I look around the room and go, God, how are you going to get this done? And all of a sudden, every time I turn around, God puts somebody in my path. This past week, I was dealing with some, some hanging some cabinets. All of a sudden, a uh, warden gave me a guy that worked with me on Friday and Saturday. The guy could build cabinets. I'm like, come on, God. You know what? I only had him for two days. Guess what? That's all I needed him for was two days. God showed up. God always shows up every time we turn around. I'm trying to tell you today, you've got to ask God, believe God, trust God. Here's the other thing here. We have to be persistent. We've got to have that bulldog. We've got to have that tenacity. There was a guy in the story in the Bible when he was said, you know, this guy came in, he had knocked on his door, and the guy was asleep with his children, and the guy had some people show up, and so he knocked on the door, he said, listen, can you have, give me some bread, because my kids, you know, give me some bread, I have company coming to my house. And the guy said, go away, come back tomorrow, we're in bed. But the guy was so persistent, so he kept knocking, he kept knocking, he kept knocking, and finally the guy opened the door. Yeah. See, sometimes for us, we've got to be persistent. Yeah. Sometimes we've got to just keep knocking and knocking and knocking. Now, sometimes, let me just say this to you, no's an answer too. And we got to get to that point sometimes we say, okay, God, if no's the answer, I'm going to accept it and I'm going to move on. But you know what? Sometimes I grew up in a denomination that used to teach us that if we asked more than once, then our faith was weak. Guess what? I've learned that's not true. Sometimes you got to press in, man. Listen, what did, what did Jacob do? He pressed in. He said, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Sometimes we got to be persistent in our faith. Here's the next thing. We're talking about the B, ABCs of faith. The B is we got to believe. We've got to learn to believe. This is what the Bible says in Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Therefore, I say to you, whatever, thing you ask, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. Now, we are very doubtful and we live a defeated life because we have a lot of doubt. We don't believe, right? We struggle with that thing. Now, Matthew 9, 28 says, And when he came to the house, a blind man came to him 
And Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? The blind man was looking for healing. Now, all of a sudden, Jesus asked him, do you believe that you can be healed? And what did the blind man say? Then he said, yes, Lord. Then he touched his eyes, saying, according to what? Your faith, let it be to you. And his eyes were open. Many times, we just got to say, God, it's your faith. I'm just going to trust by faith. I'm going to believe by faith. I'm going to believe, God, you can do it. We read the story. We go back and look at Mary. Mary was a young girl. According to theologians, Mary was probably 14, 15 years old. She probably wasn't that old. During that time, girls married at an early age. And so here's Mary. Mary's raised in a good home, had a good family. And all of a sudden, angel of the Lord comes to Mary and says, Mary, you're fixing to have a baby. Now, Mary asks a very important question. She says, how can this be? I've never been with a man. But all of a sudden, she realized by the power of the Holy Spirit, by faith, you know what she said? Let it be so. Let it be. Now, that's a lot of faith. Amen? When she just stopped. Because, see, here's the reality. Some of us don't like to face this. Now, obviously, God knew he chose the right person. But you know what? Mary was human. And Mary, at any given time, could have said, oh, not me. She could have said no. Come on. She was human. She could have said no. But she didn't. She said, by faith, I believe. Let it be so. And it was so. See, there's times in our life we just got to say, God, I'm going to believe you no matter what. God, I'm going to believe you can do all things. God, you created us. You designed us. God, you're bigger than that situation. And I'm going to believe by faith. Here's the next one. We're talking about the C. <clears throat> Confess. Romans 10.10. 10. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Sometimes we've got to confess just to hear it out loud. Amen? Now, here's our problem. Many are fearful to confess because they might be made fun of. Amen? Some of us are afraid of I'm talking about our faith or confessing our faith because somebody might make fun of us. And you know what? Here's what we live in. We live in a reality in a world where they make you feel like if you believe, if you're a Christian, you're weak-minded, you're simple. Can I tell you this out loud? You can't be a pansy and be a Christian. You can't be a sissy and be a Christian. You better bow up. Let me tell you something. Today, it takes tough men and women, men of God, women of God. We need to rise up and be believers and confess our faith. Because what does the scripture say? It says here, we need to be careful not to be ashamed. Because he says here in Mark 8, 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his glory of his Father with his holy angels. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to face that day when I'm, I'm ashamed of God. You know, I, don't, I remember I was working a consulting job when I was in seminary in Dallas, Texas, and this lady was a Christian and worked in the office, and she told me a story that happened at lunch. And I told her, I said, you know, one day I'm going to use that story, and I've used it several times since then. But she went to lunch with another lady in the office, and she said, Bobby, she said, for some strange reason, when the lady went to get in my car, I noticed my Bible sitting on the front seat. And without even thinking, before she got in the, the passenger side, she said, I grabbed the Bible and I hid it underneath the seat. And she was just baffled that she did that, you know. And I said, thank you, because I know that's going to be a good testimony one day I can use it. Amen? Amen? Because the truth is, sometimes we find ourselves in positions where we're ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, we need to be careful. Because he says, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Yeah. Now, here's what we talked about. The other part of here, he says here, he says in Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This is what we need to be, not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We need to be believers. Listen, we need to rise up as, as a church because the world is trying to stifle us down, trying to push you down, trying to shove you down. It's time that the church rises up and realizes that we have a supernatural anointing and a power that greater is the God that dwells inside of us than he's in the world. Listen, I know there's a lot of people out there, and I know that you guys in the military probably face a lot of criticism and people make fun of you and all this kind of stuff. But you know what? Man, listen, just rise up and believe God can do all things. And I promise you, if you do it right, now I'm not talking about in an arrogant, stupid way, but I'm talking about representing Christ in the right way. When that person has made fun of you, when they find themselves in trouble, you know who they're going to look for? They're going to look for you. Why? Because we need to be the real thing. Come on. We need to be like Coca-Cola, the real thing. Amen? Some of the younger generation don't even know what that is. Amen? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first, also for the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, 
The just shall live by faith. Now, I went through the ABCs, ask, believe, confess. The D is the one I want to kind of spend a little bit more time on today, okay? And here's the D. We're talking about faith. We're talking about confessing. We're talking about believing. The D is we need to be doers. Got to be a doer, doer of the faith. James says this, you believe there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. That's scary, amen? But do you want to know, oh foolish man, that without faith, without, I'm sorry, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? We pause. I mean, pause there for a second. We've got to kind of ponder on that a little while. Because we don't want to, you know, we want to say, well, you know, oh, well, I believe, I believe. The truth is, you only do what you believe. Because, I mean, that was a reality for me of many times when I became a pastor and people would come to me and say, Pastor, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. And I was looking at their life and they wouldn't do anything they said they believed. Yeah, come on now. And so I struggled with that until finally one day God gave me the revelation and said, you know what? People only do what they believe. Yeah. If you don't believe it, you won't do it. You'll say it, but unless you really do it, you don't believe it. I know we use a chair as an analysis because it's a simple one. But we can look at these chairs. They're made by chair, church chairs, and, and they're designed by engineers. And I mean, they got all these great, I mean, these chairs are wonderful, and they're designed to hold so much weight. But until we put our posterior in, in them, we don't believe that they really hold us. Right. We can talk about it all day long. We can say it all day long. But unless you actually put your feet to the faith, do you really believe it? Do you really believe it? And see, this is a part here. I'm going to tell you real quick. This is where the rubber meets the road right here. Because we can talk about it all day long. You can talk about it till you're blue in the face. But unless you're willing to do it. I remember a story. I was reading a story about a guy who was walking a tightrope. And he was really good. And he was walking this tightrope. And, and, and finally, he looked at one of the guys and said, you know, man, I'm getting really good at this thing. And one of the guys says, you know what? I believe that you can walk across that tightrope pushing a wheelbarrow. Do you believe that? He said, oh, without a doubt, man, I believe that you could walk across that tightrope pushing that wheelbarrow. He said, well, if you believe it, then get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> Come on. We can tell somebody else, I believe you can do it all day long, but are you willing to get in the wheelbarrow? Here's again, I'm telling you this morning, I hope, and if I have to stop right here and pause right here, this is the part that I really want to hammer home. Because if we're going to really be supernatural men and women of God, We've got to begin to operate in our faith. We've got to begin to do what we, we believe God can do. Again, we say God is greater than God is inside of us, and he's in the world. We've got to believe that. You've got to begin to walk it out. Now, if what he said, he said, uh, faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Now, according to theologians during this time, this was not a really strange thing to do. A human sacrifice was not uncommon. Now, we look at it now and see this being barbaric and crazy and wild, and we can't believe somebody would do that. But during this time, that was not something that was not unheard of. But all of a sudden, now here's Abraham who was given Isaac as a promise because Abraham now is 100 years old, and Sarah wasn't no spring chicken either. And all of a sudden, now they got a, they got a baby because it was a promise by God. It took him a while, even to the point where Abraham thought, well, you know what, let me help God. And so he, he wound up sleeping with, with uh, Sarah's maidservant, and now we got... Ishmael, come on, somebody. But also now he has Isaac, and Isaac, all of a sudden God tells him, he said, look, I want you to sacrifice him. Now, don't you think that was a tough step? Isaac's like, because Isaac, obviously, old enough to understand what his father's about to do. And so he goes to a place, and, he's, and you know, he, he lays him out. He's fixing to sacrifice his son. But you know what? By faith, he believed, and God showed up. We know the story. God showed up, and he offered a ram as a sacrifice. You see, these are things that we have to talk about. If he's willing to say, okay, I'm willing to sacrifice, and I believe with all my heart he was willing to sacrifice because I know without a doubt he was probably thinking, God, if I truly sacrifice him, you're going to raise him from the dead because he's a promise. He knew that he was a promise of God. See, we got to stand on God's promises. We got to know what God's promise is. If God promised you something, learn to stand on it, man. Get your feet, foundation, get foundation on whatever the promise of God is. Say, God, you said it. I believe it. I'm going to stand on it. God, I'm not going to move. I'm going to hang on. I'm telling you, this is going to be the separation of, of, of more people today when we understand that we're going to have to stand on the promises of God. Now, Abraham, it goes on to say, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. 
Without it, it wasn't made nothing. It was all talk. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only? Now, again, this is a part that none of us like to hear. James says this, do not be deceived, he says. My beloved brother, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Now, just jump down a little bit. Let's jump down to verse uh, 19. So then, my beloved uh, brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, this is what become a doer here, verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness, all and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word. Let me read that again. Receive with meekness the implanted word. What is the implanted word? The B-I-B-L-E, the Bible. Thank God for the Bible. Thank God that we have the Word of God. This is the Word of God that we study, folks. I tell people all the time, don't believe nothing i got to say. Read it for yourself. Find out what the Word of God says for yourself because there's going to come a time when somebody's going to try to twist the Word of God. And see, Satan cannot invent anything. All he can take what God already done and try to pervert it. And so we got to stand on the Word of God. And so he says here, he goes on to say, he says, um, be a doer. Therefore, he says, uh, uh, implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Verse 25, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. God wants us to walk out our faith. Amen? Now, what I want to do is I want to pull out a few things that I believe we need to have as a doer. If we're going to be a doer of faith, these are some of the things that I think are part of our life or we need to put as part of our life to be doers of the word, be doers of our faith. The first one is simply this. As a doer of faith, we must first... Be a seeker of God's kingdom and his righteousness. Okay? What do you mean by that, Pastor? We put God first in everything we do. We put God, we seek God first before we make any decision. We seek God first before we make any financial decision. We seek God first before we make any, especially any, any kind of decision when it comes to marriage. Come on. Listen, you need to teach your children to seek God first before it comes to marriage. Come on. Come on. I'm telling you, we need to put God first. Many times, you know why we don't seek God? Because we don't really want to know what he has to say because we, we already made up our mind what we want to do. Yeah. Yeah, come on now. I had a lady call me one time, called me from a car dealership. She said, hey, Pastor, you told me to call you if I have any questions or whatever, and this guy's got this deal, and, man, it looks like a really good deal. So she tells me the deal. You know what I told her? I said, walk away. Run. It's not a good deal. I'm telling you, it's not a good deal. They're taking advantage of you. Run. I hung up the phone. Next morning, I walked, pulled up. Guess what she pulled up in? That car. That wasn't a good deal. You know what? She wasn't willing to listen to counsel. Two weeks later, she was asking me, can you get me out of this mess? Come on. I'm telling you, there comes a time in our life we have to say, oh, God, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe you. I'm going to accept you, and I'm going to do what you say. Instead of, we already make up our own mind. It's a good deal. Why did you call me and ask me if you didn't want to know? See, that's when we come to God and say, God, you know what? In our mind, we've made up our mind that we think it's right. But you know what? Many times, God shuts the door. I remember when my wife and I were doing financially, we were doing very well, and we, we designed a house. I mean, I spent like $1,000 with an architect. We had designed the house. We was going to build this house, and we had all the plans. I mean, all this stuff was going on. All of a sudden, God, we started praying, and God shut the door. Boom. Don't build a house. You know what we did? We rolled up the plans. We stuck them in the closet. Right after that, God called me into the ministry. I know without a doubt in my heart that if I would have followed through with building that house, that house would have probably held me from making the decision to go to seminary. I'm talking to somebody today. I'm talking to somebody that needs to hear what I'm, I'm saying today. Because I'm telling you today, listen, you've got to seek God first in all your decision making. Amen. There's many times when we seek God first before we even, if we go into Baton Rouge. Well, God, do you want us to take one night or you want to take the interstate? I know it sounds silly for some of y'all. But you know what? You never know how God's going to put something along the road that we need to see or need to do or, or protect us from an accident. Yeah. You never know. Yeah, I'm telling you that we need to get to a place in our life where we put God first in all our decision-making. Yeah. 
everything we do. This is what the Bible says. Let me read it to you. Matthew 6, 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall I eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? See, we worry about all those things, right? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, this word righteousness, we look at it and we go, oh, what's that mean? It means to be in right standing with God. If you're going to seek his righteousness, it means do what's right. Do the right thing. If you're going to seek God's righteousness, it means, you know what? God, I'm going to do what's right. And we know what's right. How do we know what's right? If you've got the Holy Spirit of God in your life, you're a born-again believer, and you begin to allow the Holy Spirit to operate in your life, the Holy Spirit will shut you down when you're not doing something right. Come on. Now, we can drown them out. Come on. We can drown them out. Oh, I want to hear it. Bye, bye, bye. They're going to do what we want to do. Instead of letting the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and direct us, because that's what the Holy Spirit's job is to do. Why wouldn't we want him to do his job? Let him do his job. Let him, when we seek God and say, Holy Spirit of God, direct us, guide us, lead us. God, I, I want what you want. God, it's not what I want. Many times we just get so self centered until we think we know better. Church, I'm telling you, I, I'm trying to help you right now. And, and, and if I could teach you anything as, as a parent, teach your kids to seek God first in all their decision making. When it comes to a spouse, get them praying now. Well, if they're only 14, 15, get them to write down what they want in a spouse now. Because when that counterfeit comes, and they do come, you'll recognize it as being a counterfeit. And you know that's not the right one. I'm telling you this morning, we got to put God first back in our lives. If you put God first in your life, I, you know, we, we, we remember the big deal, WWJD. Well, we had the bracelet, you know. I got the bracelet, I got the T-shirt, I got the necklace, WWJD, right on. Everybody's cool. But you know what? We need to get to the stop to a place where we say, what would Jesus do? Amen. What was it, J.D., we, somebody said, was, what would Jermaine something, <laughs> pre-do? But we got to get back to that. I'm telling you this morning, God wants to hear from his people. God wants to hear from his children. Don't you want to hear from your kids? When your kids are struggling and they're going through something difficult, as a parent, isn't it nice to know when they come and say, Dad, what do you think? And it's really nice is when they listen. Come on. Because, you know, you might have went down a road to keep them from making a bad choice. Let me, let me share something with you. Ready? You don't have to pet a snake to know a snake bites. Snakes bite. Well, I got to find out for myself. Whack. <laughs> okay. Draw back a nub. Here's your sign. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's the next one. I'm talking about doer of faith. Before you shout me down on this one, let me finish talking about it. All right? Doer of faith, understanding God. A doer of faith understands God gave us life with abundance. Amen. Amen. Now, when I say that like that, immediately you think, well, he's talking about the prosperity message. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? Let me read it to you, then I'm going to explain it. 10.7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear me. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go into out and find pasture. The thief, the thief, talking about Satan, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. This is what Jesus said. I have come that they might have life and that they may have it ab more abundantly. Now, let me back up a little bit. I want you to understand something. When the children were in Egypt, they were in captivity. When they were in captivity, they had not enough. They lacked. When he took them out of captivity and he put them into the, prom put them into the, to the desert with manna, it was just enough. But when he took them from captivity to the desert, he brought us into the promised land. Well, now we have more than enough. Amen. Amen. Now, when I talk about abundant living, I talk about going from glory to glory. Come on, somebody. Amen. I talk about going from peace to peace. Amen. I talk about going from joy to joy. Yeah, 
I'm talking about being happy, happy, happy. I'm talking about those things are abundant living. If you look at it, if you think abundant living is because you got, look, there are people out there that have mansions with a, with a bank full of money that are not living an abundant life. Don't get misunderstood. See, God wants the joy of the Lord as an abundance in our life because the joy of the Lord is our strength. When we have joy in our life, when we have peace in our life. Listen, there are people today that would spend billions of dollars to have the peace you have. And you might not have, you might not have two nickels you can rub together. You've got to understand that God wants us. Now, here's what our problem is. Here's a problem. Too many people today are living from drama to drama. They're going from drama to drama. Every time I turn around... Man, I, they're going from drama to drama. I, I, I know people like that. Every time you talk to them, they just, they're just going from drama to drama. They have no peace in their life, no hope in their life. I was real pleased when we were talking about their 40th anniversary, and, and, and she got up and shared with her parents, and she said, we were laughing at the table because she said, she says, you know what, my parents have been married 40 years. She says, I thought all marriages were like that, you know, because they got a good marriage. They, have a good, they, they, they had a good marriage. You know, they might have had issues, but they never, the kids, kids they didn't see it, you know. But she saw it as, you know, as a good thing. Guess what? That's how we ought to live in an abundant life. Amen. We ought to have good marriages with the, with the Father. Amen? But the problem is, again, let me go back again. You know, again, let me say it again. We go from drama to drama. Now, here's another one. Let me look over here. I won't even look at you when I say this one. We go from Facebook to Facebook. <laughs> There's more drama on Facebook. Lord, help our souls. <laughs> Something as good as that could be so devastating for some people. They get on there and they just vent. And they say stuff that shouldn't be said. And it's out there forever. I'm telling you today, God wants you, Troy, to live an abundant life. God wants us to live with an abundance. God wants us to have an abundance of joy, abundance of peace, abundance of all these things that he's promised for us in our life. He didn't just come to give us life that we could be robots. Yeah. You know, da na na na, da na na na. Make the donuts, <laughs> like the Dunkin' Donut guy. Time to make the donuts. That's all he ever did: make donuts. God wants us more than making donuts. He wants us to eat them too. Amen. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> if anybody goes near Krispy Kreme, can you bring me some back? <laughs> If you ain't never had Krispy Kreme, you ain't never had a donut. I'm just being honest, man. Those Krispy Kreme, when you see that hot sign blinking, you know what that is? That's abundant life. How do you spell, how do you spell abundance? Hot donuts. <laughs> New definition, amen? God wants us to live with an abundance, amen? Here's the next one. A true doer of faith always walks in integrity. A true doer of faith always always walks in integrity. David cries out in Psalms 26. He says, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. I love that. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart for your loving kindness before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I have walked in integrity. Several places he says, Psalms 41, But you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them by this, I know that you will well please with me because my enemy does not triumph over me. As for you, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before you face forever. Many places, Proverbs says in 10.9, He who walks with integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will become known. In other words, your sins will find you out. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 11.3, The integrity up of the upright will guide you. But the perverse of the unfaithful will destroy them. 19.1. The fear of the Lord leads to life. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. Better is the poor who walks in integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. It's better to be poor and live a life of integrity than be rich and be a fool. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Now, here's one here. Let me, let me help you with this one. This is a good one here. Proverbs 27. The righteous man. Now, when he's talking about man here, he's talking about mankind. The righteous man, my woman, the righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Amen. Can I tell you, mother and father, when you walk in integrity, your kids are going to be blessed too? 
because they see what's going on. They know things that others don't know. Walking in integrity is doing the right thing when no one's looking. Amen. Walking in integrity, sometimes it's not easy. <laughs> I remember one time, Judy and I were dealing with, with something that's been years ago. We had a, our CPA back home, and, and I had some rent property back home, and we were doing something. He said, you know, he said, didn't you do this on your rent property? He's nodding his head because he wanted me to say yes. Because if I'd have said yes, it would have meant more money coming back to us. And he said, didn't you do this on your property? I said, no, I didn't. <laughs> didn't you do this? I said, no, I didn't. And finally he said to me, I knew you wouldn't do it. But you know what? Let me tell you something. That guy got cancer, and he died. But before he died, when he had cancer, you know who he called? He called me. Why? Because I was the, he knew it was a real deal. Listen, people search out people with integrity. Amen. I remember one time when, when, when Lowe's was on the other side of on, on Across the street, where it's at now. And I was building my house back here, and, I, and I had, they had brought some stuff to my house, and they had brought two big boxes of screws, and I only paid for one. And I brought it back. It was like $40. I wanted to bring it, so I brought it back and said, look, they dropped this off at my house, and I didn't pay for it. And I remember the lady looking at me like, what? I can't believe you're bringing that back. And I gave it to her. I said, well, I didn't pay for it. I said, I ain't going to hell over no $40 screws. <laughs> It wasn't a week later, I'm walking through Lowe's. I heard the lady say, hey, hey, hey. I said, yes, ma'am. She started crying. She was going through something. I said, can I pray with you? She said, please. And I prayed with her. What does integrity do? It opens doors. It opens doors so that we can begin to minister to people because they're looking for the real deal. Amen. Amen. There are people that are looking for somebody that's honest. Yeah. Doing the right thing when no one's looking. Amen. Integrity. Now, here's, here's a definition of your character. Your character is what they call you when they don't know your name. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Have you ever worked with somebody, you can't remember their name, and you go, you know that guy that's always late? That's their character. You know that guy that's always complaining about his wife? That's their character. When you don't know their name, and you call them by whatever you know them by, that's what their character is. Now, here's a question for you. What do people call you when they don't know your name? I hope to God they say, you know that pastor, the one to pray with you on the drop of a hat? You know that guy that is honest? You know that guy that was truthful? You know that guy? You know, that's what I hope. I mean, I don't want him to say, well, he was a good fisherman. You know, I mean, that'd be great, but that's not what I want. I knew a pastor one time. The visitation was a big deal in his church, and they all would go on visitation all the time. And the pastor loved the fish, so he bought a boat. And he named it Visitation. So every time someone asked, where's the pastor? He'd say, he's out on visitation. <laughs> so, I'll be here all night. <laughs> integrity. Walking it out, integrity. Here's the last one this morning, folks, is this. Well, I, I lied to you. I've got two more. <laughs> the next one is this. If you're going to be a doer of the faith, don't bury your talents. Utilize them. Don't bury your talents. There was a time when the guy came and gave the guy five and one guy two and another guy one. And when he came back, the guy who had five and two multiplied what they had. And this is what he said. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He goes to the guy that had one who didn't do anything with it. He buried it. He wound up burying it. And he said to him, why did you do this? He says, you, you know, uh, he goes on to say, he says, then who, did, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you hadn't sown and gathering where you hadn't scattered seed. Verse 25, I was afraid. That's what the guy said. I went and I hid the talent in the ground. Look, there you have what's yours. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine for a second? He gave him some to invest, and all he does is dust it off, and he gives it back to him. He didn't do anything, okay? So what does he say to him? He says, uh, so you ought to have deposited my money in the bank and so when I come back, at least I receive an interest. So he took the talent from him and gave it to the one with ten. This is what he says in verse 29. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have abundance. Go back to abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Listen, folks, God gave you talents for a reason. You know, now, I know he's talking about talents. He's using his talents as, as, a, as a money change here. But let's just use it for the talents that God give all of us. God give us talents to utilize for the kingdom of God. I remember Pastor Edwin one time said this to me. He said, you know where the wealthiest real estate in the world is? You know, of course, I was naming off different places where, where the gold was. You know, maybe, you know, South Africa where the diamonds are with this and that and everything else. He said, no, the wealthiest places in the, in the world is in the graveyard. I said, what? He said, in the graveyard are buried a bunch of talents that have never been used. And I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. There are talents in this room right now that if you utilize your talent, you can follow your kingdom. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Too many times you're not happy with your talent. You want somebody else's. Use your talent. Don't want somebody else's because you don't know what somebody else's took to get to where they're at. Oh, I want Brother, I want brother Caleb's. I want to be able to sing and play the electric guitar. You don't know his testimony. There was a time we broke his back. And I'll never forget, man. He broke his back. I rushed up there. Drew and I rushed up there. And we kind of told a little bit of a story and made light of it. But he had a broken back. Rushed him to Herman Memorial. Drew came home. I stayed with him. Didn't leave his side. Called a friend of mine, Dr. Remedios, to come preach for me. Stayed by his side. They let us out of the hospital. He was like a turtle. Had one of those shells around him. Came home. Came home, sent him home. Told me he'd be out of college for that year. He'd probably have to go through rehab, all these kind of things. Brought him back to the house. While we were at the house, my friend, Pastor E.J. Denton, he's dead now. And another guy was from South Africa. He was one of our minister friends. Came to my house, went upstairs, and was sharing, a test he was sharing his testimony with him. He shared the testimony of how, you know, he almost died when he was a young boy. After we prayed for him. They prayed for him. After they prayed for him, next thing you know, Caleb shot out of bed, pulled the turtle shell off, and ran up and down the stairs. He was totally healed. Went back to school and gave his testimony. Now, I'm telling you today this because I want you to know faith is real. Amen. You got to believe that God can. Listen, I don't mind telling you, when he was running up and down the stairs, him, his mom and I were going, <gasps> like, don't hurt yourself. He's like, I feel fine. He's bending, twisting, twisting. I'm like, oh, my God, go cut the grass. Jesus <laughs> 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 like, no, put him in the kitchen. He's washed dishes. <laughs> but the point is, you know, you don't ever know what's like. Take what God's talents God's gave you and utilize it. Here's the last one is this, simply this. If you're going to walk, be a doer of faith, you've got to have hope. You got to be a giver of hope, and you got to be a person that people want to be around you, so that your hope will rub off on them. Be a person of hope. There's so many scriptures I could read about that. I'm gonna just not read all those. But be a person of hope. You know, I mean, when I counsel, I do a lot of marital counsels, and most of the time, sometimes people stop the counsel with you on the way to divorce court. You know. And it doesn't matter to me. It really doesn't matter. I don't care what they're going through. Man, I want to be a person that's going to speak hope into their life. I want to be a person that just says, you know what, you got hope. Well, you don't know. You don't know. I, okay, but you got hope. There's always hope. You know, if we're going to be people of faith and walk this thing out and be a person that's a faith doer, we've got to be a person that has hope. Well, you don't know, what the, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what they You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. Okay, I don't know. I don't need to know. All I know is I got hope. That's why we, we, we whole campaign of us building on the hill up there. I was preaching on a Sunday morning one time, and I said, I want to be a place where people literally trip over hope. And that's why we call it that. We call it tripping over hope. Why? Because I want to be in a location that people that are looking. And there's people that's looking for hope every day. There are people that's riding up and down these streets every day looking for hope. I want to be that person that gives them that hope. Amen. If we're going to be a doer of the faith, you got to be a person of hope. you got to believe that God can do all things. And here's the thing. Let me just break it down for you this way. Some of you feel so unworthy. You feel like, how could God use you? Can I tell you what that is? That's a lie from the pits of hell. 
Because God wants to utilize everyone in this room. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you look like. I don't care how much time you serve. I don't care any of those things. All I know is God wants to use you. And if you let him, he will. And we'll finish with a story about faith. Having faith. Believe in God when we pray. There was a young girl. She was in school. This is back years ago. And she stayed after hours, and she had to take a certain bus home. And she got on the bus, and it was late, and she was tired, sleepy. And she got on the bus, and while she was on the bus, she fell asleep. And the, ride, the driver just let her sleep. Well, lo and behold, while she was sleeping, somebody on the bus stole her wallet, stole her purse. So when the bus driver was asking for people to pay, she's looking for a purse. She couldn't find a purse, and she tells the bus driver, I don't have any money. And the bus driver let her out. Right there on the spot, let her out. And it was pitch dark, probably several miles from where she lived. True story. And so a little girl gets out, and she's walking down the street, and she's upset because there's no street lights in the country. And she's walking down the road, and she's crying, and she's scared. It's dark, and she's trying to feel her way down the road and get down the road. And finally, she looks up, and in the shadow, she can see someone. And she could see his face and see the person. And the guy was really a strange guy, strange-looking guy. Well, she's looking right at him, and she's like, felt real uneasy. She was feeling really uneasy. So she started praying. I mean, she was praying. Well, for whatever reason, she walked. She had to go by him, so she walked right past him and went to her house. Well, the next day, she went back to school. Lo and behold, she found out. There was a rapist that had raped a little girl in that same area. And so when she began to tell the people, the guy she saw, she began to describe this person, it was a rapist. She saw the rapist. This guy was the rapist. And so later on, they asked the guy, he says, you raped that little girl. Why didn't you rape her? He said, well, I wouldn't go mess with her. She had two big guys standing on the side of her. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, when we believe... God is big. Amen. Amen. God can do all things. We might not see it, but you got to believe it. Amen. My grandmother, who died knowing Christ later on in life, never spoke a word of English. She was Cajun from Mamu. I've told this story a thousand times, and I'll probably continue telling it because it just blesses me every time I think about it. She could not read. She was illiterate. She could not read the English. Couldn't speak English. Somebody gave her a Bible. She couldn't read it, but she believed it. And she would take that Bible and she would set it down. My mom said she would pray. And in French, she would tap that Bible. And she'd say, little book, can't read you, but I believe you. See, that's how we need to get. We need to get to a point in our life where we say, God, I might not see it, might not understand it, but God, you said it. I believe it. That settles it for me. Father, I thank you for this time. God, I pray blessings on every man, woman, and child in this place. God, I thank you right now that we're going to be doers of our faith. God, we're going to work out the things you told us to work out. God, we're going to do the things you call us to do. God, let us be strong in our faith. God, let us not just say it. Let us do it. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe something that was said in this message really spoke to your heart about being a doer. Maybe it's an area of your life that you realize, Pastor, it's an area that I'm struggling with. That's an area that I, I need prayer in. I don't need to know what it is. I'm not here to call you out or embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Maybe one of these things that was said spoke to your heart, and you say, Pastor, that's an area I need prayer in. Right where you at, just raise your hand and put it up and put it back down. Up and down, up and down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else, just raise your hand up and down. I'm not here to call you out and embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're speaking to the hearts of your people. And God, I thank you that hands come up all over this place. And God, whatever they stand in need of, again, one more time, God, we know that you can meet those needs. So by faith, we believe that, God, that you're going to minister to them in whatever area they're struggling in, whatever area they're having a hard time in. God, I pray that you give them wisdom and strength in that area of their life. Let them be overcomers. Heads bowed, eyes closed.
Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you realize when you showed up today that you're lost in need of a Savior. Or maybe you realize today, Pastor, I'm backslidden, and I need to get my heart right with God. Right there between you and God, from the heart, just pray a simple prayer. Just begin to believe. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I repent where I failed you. Jesus, I want you to come into my life. Jesus, I want to make you my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for being there for me. Maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time. Or maybe it's a prayer of rededication. Again, I'm not here to call you out or embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. You prayed that prayer. Just right where you at. Just raise your hand and put it back down, up and down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Just raise it and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you that you are a saving God, a merciful God. God, I thank you for the hands that were raised. I pray blessings on them. God, I pray you give them strength. God, I pray you get them plugged into the right fellowship. And God, I thank you for all the things you've done for loving us. Blessings be upon this day in Jesus' name. Amen. To receive that word, let's give God.